This is Invisible Inc., the podcast for under-resourced women entrepreneurs. And I'm your host, Shubha Chakravarti, founder of Achieve. Join me as I talk to women entrepreneurs about the nuts and bolts of their journeys and to experts who will give you insights that are hard to find anywhere else. Let's jump in. What are the three non-negotiable factors every investor looks for and every founder must demonstrate to get funded? How can you create an intelligent yet simple startup roadmap no matter where you're starting and what resources you have access to? What steps do you need to take as an early stage founder to get investors excited even when the market isn't hot? In this episode, Pat Headley, veteran private equity investor, advisor, and author, talks about how to nail the trifecta of market traction, and investor returns, the surefire method of proving your concept, how to use every aspect of who you are and what you do to amplify your investment story, and much more. Now, here's Pat. Good afternoon, Pat. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you. I am so excited to be here. So you had a pretty interesting career. I know you studied computer science in school and you started off in consulting. Then you spent a long time in private equity and now you're very active in startup investing. So what's been the guiding principle that has kind of helped pave your path? I think the main guiding principle for me and the advice I give to young people is to put yourself in situations where you continue to learn. And learning never stops. I mean, I've had a very long career a number of decades now, and I'm continuing to learn. And I think that's an incredibly important part of the whole career journey is to find places where you can learn and also surround yourself with people who you enjoy being with and who can teach you along the way. And I think the more you recognize that whatever you're doing, you're not doing alone, and that there are lots of people who are further along the path or on the path with you, that those can be people who can help you and you can help them. I think it makes a huge difference in how you think about your own professional development and your career. You spent a lot of time in the private equity world. And for those of us who are not as familiar with the private equity side of things, can you explain exactly what it is and if and when that source of funding might become relevant to an entrepreneur? Private equity is a term that describes investing generally in private companies and on investing on behalf of institutions and individuals collectively called limited partners, usually is the term used in private equity. And I think of private equity as an umbrella term that covers three different areas of investing. One is those investors who look at earlier stage companies like venture capitalists, they're under the private equity umbrella. Those growth investors that invest in companies that are more established, they're larger, they have proven business models, they have revenue, customers, et cetera. And then on the large end of the size are the leverage buyout type companies where they invest in $100 million or more in very large companies, sometimes taking them private, they may be public companies going private, or sometimes purchasing them outright. And so that kind of falls under that big umbrella. On the venture capital side, and this would kind of qualify as private equity. So before you even qualify for venture capital, people get funding from a number of sources, including friends and family, angel investors, and sometimes even family offices that look at smaller opportunities. So that kind of compromises the whole kind of the umbrella of private equity as opposed to debt. So this is investing to own a piece of a company. So these are very different animals in terms of like the very early stage ventures relative to the more mature companies. Are there commonalities across the board that you would say apply regardless of what the stage of the company is that is being invested in? I think one of the most important things any investor looks at is the market. Is the market large? Is it growing? What does it look like? Is there a large market for whatever product or service it is that you propose to to launch a business for? The second is, is there traction? Now, traction at an earlier stage company looks very differently than traction at a growth size company or a much larger company. Traction means are people buying this product or service? Are you getting market share? Is it appealing to whoever the ultimate customer is? 
And then the third really important piece is management. Who's doing this? Are these people qualified to be doing this? Have they surrounded themselves with the right additional people in order to execute on whatever the vision it is that you're trying to bring to market? Small side note, I was reading this morning on LinkedIn or somewhere that as an investor, the one thing that you know that you cannot change about the company that you're going to invest in is the market. Almost anything else can be changed. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with that? Or how true is that in terms of? Well, look, anything can be changed in a business. And some people advise you to work on something. If you have to fail, fail fast and redirect. It doesn't often happen that you go from providing, say, an industrial product to going to a healthcare product. It's not out of the question that whatever it is that you're producing might be more appropriate for one market versus another market. I actually very much believe that the hardest thing to change is who the CEO, founder, and leader is. And this is true kind of across that spectrum. People do change executives, CEOs, if things aren't working out, but that is a harder change. And bringing in the right people is the most important thing that you can do if you believe in the market and you believe that the product or service being offered is going to get traction. So you talked about failing fast, failing early. A lot of that kind of speaks to the earlier stage investing. So what got you interested in early stage investing and how are you involved in that sphere now? Sure. So I spent nearly three decades, so 30 years of my career with a growth equity firm. These are companies that were up and running. They had product market fit in many cases. You could do what is called due diligence, which is you could talk to customers and clients, see what they say about the products and services, get a feel for whether what the company is saying and what the customers are saying match and align and make sense. And so that was a wonderful experience for me. I left about seven years now with the idea that I would invest in and advise growth companies. So my original plan was not to invest in very early stage. I actually still like the idea of finding companies that do have some revenue, that do have an actual product or service that you can actually talk to customers and clients and see how they're doing. I find it a little bit challenging investing in de novo ideas or business plans where some of the real important work hasn't yet been done. For example, figuring out product market fit, figuring out who are the right customers. And one of the things that I hesitate to do in very early stage companies is to make an investment when they don't yet understand their customer base. So the advice I would give to anyone starting a business is to think hard about what it is you're trying to do. What market is it that you're trying to address? What is the product or service that you are offering to a potential client, whether that client is a consumer or client or an enterprise client, so a business client, and test it out. Because if you can't test that out, first of all, you can't be convinced that what you're doing is going to work. And you can't then convince somebody else to provide capital and let you go and pursue that idea. So even early stage companies with just an idea can go that next step to test out what people think and whether it's having an enterprise client use their product, give them feedback, be an early stage adopter, find either financial or you know intelligent contractual ways to to show that yes they're interested yes they want to do this i mean you need that as a founder of a company and you're going to be able to have to use that experience and that knowledge to gain investors and to have somebody provide you the capital to continue to do the work that you're doing and that's true for any big company any of the you know, you always hear about the unicorns, the people that did tremendously well. Even when Uber was first started, it was an idea, but there was enough around the idea. It was certainly a huge market. Transportation and connecting people with cars was like super important. But having a test app to show this is how it would work, this is why it would be appealing, and having people say, oh, yes, this is something I'd use, and then having a business plan to show this is how the financials are going to look at this point in time, or next year, or in five years, those are very important considerations as you start a business. 
It's awesome. So you actually shown a huge light on one of the biggest differences between investing in more mature or later stage companies versus early stage companies. And the one theme that I kind of picked up loud and clear is this point around being able to test traction, being able to test whether there is in reality something there that would justify an investment. The challenge is, there are two sides of the challenge, right? The first challenge you spoke about as an investor, how do you know it's not vaporware, right? It's a brilliant idea, but who knows? Yeah, you can test the market. You don't know if it's going to be real. What does it translate into in terms of the founder side of being an early stage founder and still needing capital? And therefore, what counsel would you give to someone who's an early stage founder in terms of should they even be looking for funding? And if so, where should they go look for how much and what should they, what are the non-negotiables they should be watching out for? That's a very loaded set of questions. There's a lot to unpack over there. And so much of it depends on what the business is and at what point you one is in their career. Say it's somebody who's worked several years for a company. And as part of their career progression, they found that there is a service that the company would need that nobody is providing. And so they decide to leave their job and say, you know what, I'm going to be able to provide the service. You have to then figure out what is the service? How much does it cost to deliver it? Say it's a software package, has to be written. How much does it cost to do that? And if I were to do that, would my customer buy it? A really great way to proceed in that instance would be, okay, go back to your former employer, see if they might fund some of it for you, see if they might be a potential client for you. If you're a coder and you could code it yourself, great. You might not be paid for that period of time, but that's the investment you're making in that firm. And then once you've developed something and you have some relationship with some client, then you can start to think about how do I make this bigger and how quickly do I want to do it and what is the cost to doing that? Because in an ideal world, you build a business where you sell something, you sell it for a profit. And the profits help generate the growth that you're going to experience over time. It may be slower growth than if you got a capital infusion. If you get a capital infusion, you're going to give up some ownership of that company. So you're not going to be 100% owner anymore. You're going to be an X percent owner. And for that amount of money, you should be able to grow the value of the business that much quicker. And you have to say, where am I going to spend that money? How is that money going to have a payoff for me? So that I'm going to build a real business that generates cash. A lot of people go into businesses not really thinking about the economics of the business. If you give things away, it's easy to do that. People are happy to buy products all day long if you're giving it to them. You have to be able to get value for what you're producing. You have to be able to price it well. You have to be able to deliver it well. And you have to be able to make money on it. The hard knocks of that is probably one of the most important things in starting a business is really thinking about how am I going to make money and how long will it take for me to get to a point where the business is generating cash and doesn't require additional capital from me, from my friends and family, from potentially angel investors or others. And if it does in fact show traction and it is a great idea, then it does make sense to take this idea to you know, another source of capital, like a venture capitalist or other people who are willing to invest. If it's large enough, certainly growth equity firm. Great. So what kind of emerged as you were talking was initially you do have to have a blueprint that makes sense. That blueprint has to work at least in theory because it's tapping a big market. It's tapping an important problem and it's doing it in a way that's attractive to somebody who will pay money for it. That's your kind of your blueprint part. The second part I picked up is if you're early stage, the more you can translate that blueprint into tangible evidence that you can show whether yourself to an employee, a customer or a partner or a funder, the better off you're going to be. And probably the more favorable the terms are that you're going to be able to contract for lack of a better word with any of these folks. And the third piece is, slightly tangentially is all around the importance of cash and the importance of making sure that numbers are always adding up to make economic sense and to keep you solvent sort of in the short term and in the long term before you decide to pick the scale that you want to operate in and therefore figure out how much capital you need. Is that a fair characterization of what you just laid out? I, 
Yes, I think that's very fair. I wouldn't normally direct somebody to watch a TV show, but I do think Shark Tank is very informative for anybody launching a company because it is meant for entertainment. So there are certain things that are probably a little bit overstated, but take a look at the people who actually have a product and they show it to the investors and the investors get to say, this is something that I think is fantastic. It's going to do really well. Or for whatever reason, this is something that doesn't make sense at all. And I think that it's very informative in terms of how one thinks about creating a business and starting a business. If you're going to start a business that addresses the consumer, and let's say it's a food business, you have to test that. You have to see what is it that I'm making. I'm making a special kind of muffin, right? Are people going to like it? How much does it cost me to make it? How am I going to distribute it? Am I going to go direct to consumers or am I going to go through the retail channel? There are a whole host of complications associated with that. And I actually think it is perfectly fine to try something that you may not be an expert in. But if that is the case, you have to do two very important things. You have to learn as much as you can really fast from people who do know what they're doing. And then you have to write people around you to help advise you. So I'm not saying don't launch a business where you know nothing about it. It is so much better to launch a business if you do know something about it, for sure. But if you decide to do something very different, and sometimes great innovation happens when somebody doesn't know why you can't do something, they can be incredible innovators, but they better find people who do understand all the pitfalls and have done a bunch of things going forward. And I'll give you one example. I met two young women. I invested in them and they were fairly early. They wanted to develop very comfortable, modern women's flat shoes. They had not created shoes before in their lives, but they found people who did. They had a very specific idea of what they were going to do and how they were going to do it. They had an incredibly smart business plan. They were very focused If you ask them, what else are you going to do? Some people might have said, oh, we'll do handbags, we'll do clothing. No, they were focused on one thing, just shoes. This company has been in business six years. They've developed an unbelievable brand. I'm super proud of these two young women. They run MargotNY.com and they make a whole series of beautiful shoes now. But they started slow. They built up. They got some angel funders. I was an early funder, an unusual early funder, but... Why did I fund? Certainly market for it. Totally understood that they were trying to fill a specific niche within the market. And I was very impressed by these two young women. Amazing. That's a great story. And I'll definitely check out the website. MargoNY.com is what you said, correct? Yeah, M-A-R-G-A-U-X. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. You talked about kind of going out and having all your ducks in a row, so to speak, when you go out to raise funds which means that the market is going to be a big factor in terms of how you come out of all of this. Last year was a great, I mean, I should say 21 was a great year. 22, you started to see things going downhill. And now it's a really different market than what it was two years ago. So my question is, if you're a founder who's looking to raise funds, to what extent does the market play into this? And the part that I don't understand, and maybe many other founders don't, is in early stage, you're relatively speaking pretty far from an exit. And presumably your investors, especially venture capitalists, have a lot of dry powder because they do understand that there are multiple rounds that may be needed. They might want to participate in follow-on rounds and stuff like that. Can you help us understand why the market is such a big driver and what you as a founder should do when you have no control over what's happening outside? You only control your business. Sure. Well, look, the market is an indication of how confident people are. I think there's always money out there. But people are sometimes reluctant to invest that money because they're worried about what the economy is going to do. They're worried about what other opportunities there might be out there. They're worried and sometimes they're concerned about the value of some of their other investments. And so there are, I would call it cautionary times from an investor's perspective and more aggressive times. But there is capital out there. There is capital available to be invested. The question is, are people being more selective or are they being a little bit more open-minded? And if they're being more selective, then it's much harder to get access to that stream of capital. If they're being open-minded, there's more access to it. So I think 
we're probably at a time when people are being a little bit more selective because they're worried about the economy. And there may be businesses that will probably suffer in this economy and therefore may not be able to get investment as easily unless they differentiate what they're trying to do. And unless they find ways to say, I'm going to take advantage of this dislocation. And that is why you should be investing in me. So regardless of what's happening in the market, you have to be very thoughtful about how it's impacting your business and your story and why it's better or worse for you. Like even during the COVID period, there were those businesses that suffered, travel, entertainment, I could name many. And there were those businesses that actually benefited in some ways, right? I mean, it, Zoom, for example, we could have just as easily had this conversation by Zoom three years ago, and most people didn't. And because of the dislocation that occurred, all sorts of things happened. Furniture for home offices, took off during that time because people had demand for it. Renovating actually took off because people were home. So it depends on what's happening out there and how you take advantage of it, whether you're in a good position to take advantage of it. Airlines were in a pretty bad position when COVID hit and people weren't traveling. So they had to figure out what to do. Now we're at the opposite end of that. And they have to find how do they meet demand because people are starting to travel again. So it depends on where you are in the cycle, what you're doing, and how you can react to whatever the external factors are. Which kind of comes back to the same. It all comes back to building a very solid business and having a rock solid plan to cash, regardless of what happens, it's going to put you in a better position no matter what. That brings us pretty naturally to kind of the process of getting money and how the whole investment process takes place. So can you give us a high level of how an investor looks at early stage? Now? What does a pipeline look like? How do they source deals? What should a founder know about how investors source and look at these deals at a high level? And then we'll dive into the specifics of the process. Sure. Let me just give this other little feedback related to investors. And I always find that in life, it's good to put yourself in the shoes of the person that you know, you're know you trying to negotiate with or deal with. Investors have many objectives. But to make it really simple, they have two objectives. One, don't lose money, right? They really want to make sure that if they give you money, that you're not going to lose that money and you're not going to go bankrupt. So that's one thing they're really trying very hard to solve for. That's the risk management part. The other piece is they want to make money, right? And if you make some return on that money, it's certainly better than losing the money. If you make an incredibly great return on that money, that's wonderful. That's the goal. That's what you'd like to achieve. The venture capital model is a little bit different than the growth equity model. The venture capital model, they're willing to invest in 10 companies and every one of those 10 companies they invest in because they think it's going to be an incredible home run. In fact, that will not be the case. One of them, they might be right on one of them. It's a little bit like throwing darts at a dartboard. And if one of them is an incredible home run, then it's okay if the other ones don't do so well, because that one will take care of everything. Growth equity investors think about it differently. They actually would rather throw fewer darts and have them hit the board than not. They'd rather put money in and not lose money. Not lose money is like an important part of the thesis. And they want to work with those companies to be able to make some return over time, to make some money over time. So understanding the investor's perspective, I think is very important from a founder CEO's perspective, right? So you have to understand that it, when you're dealing with a venture capitalist, they're going to be looking to see how are you going to perform so that you can do really well? And what is the case for that? Does it make sense? Sometimes earlier stage investors may not have such a high bar that they want it to be a unicorn or a billion dollar company. But even in those instances, again, they don't want to lose money and they want to find ways that that money is going to be spent well, spent wisely, creating a business that has some value over time. So that's a good mindset to remember. And therefore, investors really like it when founder CEOs are vested in the business. They like to see it when you put your own money in, they like to see it when you know this is you have total commitment to the business they actually like to see individuals who've gone through hardship 
Because one of the hardest things in running your own business is it is practically guaranteed you're going to have hardship. So if you can prove to an investor that you are the type of person who is going to run through mountains and really work hard to make sure that your business succeed, and if you in fact are that person, because authenticity I think is incredibly important, then I think you have an advantage. Then you're going to be able to attract somebody who's going to say, you know what? I believe in you. I'm going to bet on you and I'm going to help you succeed. So again, how you position yourself, who you are as a person, all of that really matters in terms of how you embark on building a business. And the investor is going to be testing for that. They are going to be testing to see if, do I feel comfortable that this person is going to be a good steward of my capital and they're not going to lose it? Not only that, they're going to help me make money over time because that's the risk that I'm taking. So a couple of things here. In tactical terms, somebody gets introduced to you, let's say it's a woman or a woman of color, and there's an idea. What happens next? Like, what is the first thing you look at? What is the second thing you look at? And how do you balance the intangibles of you looking me in the eye, for example, and then looking at my business plan? And especially where there are some possibilities of bias, whether explicit or not, how do you see that dynamic playing out? It's a really good question. And and look, I may have a different perspective on this than other people, but I actually think when an investor recognizes a really good business and a really good business idea that is being promoted by somebody who has a lot of experience and has the capability to launch and execute on that business, I think people get enthusiastic. And I think there's a little bit of colorblindness when it comes to that. If you have an incredibly great business and you are perfectly the person to do it with the right background, with the right advisors, with the right team, I think people are willing to sponsor that. I certainly am. To me, it's much more about, again, product market fit, traction, and the background of the individual and what they're attempting to do. And whether I believe they have kind of the, again, the two most important things that a founder has to have, perseverance to be able to go through difficulty because it is hard to be an entrepreneur and resilience and the ability to learn and change over time. Because there is no question that whatever you think you're going to do at the very beginning, it's going to be changed and adjusted and evolved over a period of time. And so that's kind of the judgment that you make. And a lot of it from an investor's perspective is pattern recognition. So investors see lots and lots and lots of entrepreneurs. They hear lots and lots of pitches and they can make some judgment. Is this person someone who I really believe in or not? And then they also, in general, have some idea of the market, the product and the other competitors within the area. So any sophisticated investor has done a fair bit of work on who else is doing this? what's differentiated about what I'm looking at now versus what's already out in the marketplace. If it is truly unique, they will go the extra step and say, let me talk to your clients and customers. Let me see the product. Let me get some idea of how it's being, how quickly sales are increasing. If you have a website and you've marketed the product on the website and you could show month to month increases, that's compelling. And you need to be able to show some of those metrics to make the case. And it's hard just saying, I have a great idea. I'd like to get funding. I think that's very hard to do in almost every market. You need a whole lot more effort and work in order to get funding. A couple of questions on that. One, you talked about pattern recognition. I'm going to pressure test that just a tiny bit, right? So pattern recognition has two, there's a bright side and a dark side, right? So if I don't come from Stanford, there's a pattern recognition ding against me. And the flip side to that is you talked about perseverance and the ability to handle adversity and resilience. What does it look like to a typical investor in terms of what they look for in a typical founder? And what are the domains in which I, as a non-traditional founder, can come to you and say, I might not look like a Stanford CS graduate, but here's how I can demonstrate to you that I do have those qualities that you're looking to check. Uh, in terms of perseverance or whatever else those attributes or conditions are. Right. I think you're totally right. I do think in certain places, having the right 
educational degree may be something that does impact decision making. I actually think from my perspective, it's more about experiences and it's more about surrounding yourself with the right people. So if someone comes to me and says, I have this great idea, I've been working on it totally by myself and I think it's going to work, is very different from, I have this great idea, I have a series of advisors who've been helping me on it, I have some clients that I have tested this with, and oh, by the way, I've actually launched two other businesses, none of which may have become unicorns, but let me tell you what I learned in each of those instances. So let me tell you what I've learned from my past experiences, whether they are successes or failures. I actually don't even like the word failure. Everything's about learning. So if the company didn't do well, what would you do differently now? What did that experience teach you to make you a better founder CEO now? And very interestingly, a lot of people who are successful have had failed experiences prior to. And so I actually don't think that's a negative at all. If you've run one or two businesses that haven't done well, I actually would prefer to invest behind somebody who's had those experiences as long as they've learned from them. So if they're going to make the same mistakes again, I actually don't want to invest behind them. But if they are launching their third company and this time they're going to figure out they're doing it in a different way, they know what they did wrong, they have the right advisors behind them, they're smart about product market fit, that to me is much more compelling. And then I care less about what their education is, because there are so many entrepreneurs who haven't even completed their education. They're just natural entrepreneurs. They love running businesses. And that to me says a lot. That's the pattern I kind of like to see. Sounds to me almost like for all of these qualities, the questions that are kind of invisible in the investor's minds, it's on the entrepreneur or the founder to say, let me prove to you whether by tangible, here's my customer orders or here's the sales for the last six months. And or, or here's all the things from my background that you may not see on my face that should give credence to whatever I'm telling you that I'm going to be able to pull off. I think that's exactly right. And I think there are people who have had terrible hardships. They've come from another country. They grew up in surroundings where they didn't have advantages and they've struggled through that. And they're super hardworking and they're incredibly resilient and throw an obstacle and they'll say, fine, I'm going to get right through that obstacle. That to me is a compelling story. I think that hearing about experiences like that, that makes you think this person's not going to give up. And you need to solve for that. It sounds like it's almost okay to be able to bring in those personal stories. You hear different theories on that to say, you know, stick to business, especially if you're a woman or, you know, you come from a different country or culture or whatever. Just say, demonstrate that you can talk the talk and you can walk the walk and don't bring in anything extraneous versus bring all of who you are, especially, you know, to the extent it's relevant to the story you're telling. It sounds to me like you're ranging on the side of, If it's relevant, pack it in and make sure you show them why it makes sense and why it it makes you a more investable founder and a more investable business. That's my perspective. I do believe in that. I do think it is about the individual. And I think it's hard to fully understand how a person's going to behave in the future unless you have some sense of who they are. I think it's incredibly important to be authentic. I do think that there are certain qualities that are incredibly important as a founder entrepreneur. And if you can demonstrate those, it helps make your case. And like I said, it's perseverance, resilience, it's fearlessness, it's curiosity, it's an ability to get help when you need to get that help. Nobody does this alone. And I think those people who are resourceful in that way, I think have an advantage. I actually think those people who have good networks and are willing to find people to help them have an advantage. Those people who are talking to funders well before they need funding, talking to employees well before they need to hire them, talking to customers and clients all the time, because you should be doing that for sure. But you have to have these conversations so that you know where you're going. And so much of it is, you know, a metaphor I like to use is if you're going on a road trip, you need to know where you're going. And it's really helpful if you say you're going from New York to California, are you taking the Southern route? Are you taking the Northern route? How many days is it going to take? How much money is it going to cost? I mean, you got to plan out all of that. And those people who can say, I'm going from New York to LA, I'm taking the Southern route, I'm going on this highway, it's going to take me a month to do it. These are the stops I'm going to make. 
and I'm going to, by the way, investor, who I don't need quite yet, I am going to tell you when I've hit those stops, just like I said I would. And I like talking to companies early so that they can tell me what they're going to do, and I could check in with them and see if they actually did what they're going to do. And if, in fact, they get to Colorado and there was a huge snowstorm and they were delayed by three days and they said, oh, my God, there's a huge snowstorm. I'm going to be delayed by three days. That's the reason I didn't make it. I get that. You can't control the weather. But knowing it, planning for it, being mindful of it, all of that is like super important. And And that's why developing relationships with people who could fund you, telling them what you're going to do, and then saying... I talked to you a quarter ago and I told you I'd have three clients by now, three enterprise clients. I have four and there's real traction here. I'm really excited about it. I'm going to give you another update in another six months. I think I'm going to roll it out even further. Oh my God, I'm starting to feel good as an investor or a potential investor. I'm going to say, when can I invest? Because you're doing what you said you're going to do. These are simple ways to think about it, but I do think it's really effective for founders to hear this. And I'm going to come right back to that because there's a whole bunch of questions I want to ask you about building networks. So hold that thought for a minute. I do have a couple of quick questions on the funding process itself. One of the things you mentioned early on that was like a star feature was this question of risk, this concept of risk and how important and paramount that is from an investor standpoint. So you're looking to de-risk any startup proposition or an investment proposition as much as possible so that you can minimize the risk and maximize the return. How should a founder Think about these dimensions of risk and what are intelligent and effective ways a founder can deploy or think about to help the investor understand that the risks have been A, understood and identified and B, mitigated. I think that is the question that a founder should be asking themselves is how do I do that? Again, back to what I said, first of all, the biggest risk is this is too small of a market that even if you launch this product, it's never going to be big. There aren't enough people who are truly interested in this. So you have to mitigate kind of that risk right up front. Is this big enough? Will there be enough customers and clients who are super excited about what you're doing? And then is what you're doing differentiated enough that you can actually penetrate the market? Because very likely there are other players. Okay, say you're making muffins. Lots of people make muffins. What's special about your muffin? And what are you going to do differently that's going to make it appealing? So you have to then mitigate that risk of, and one way to say is, look, Mike, I am sold out of these muffins every day. I double the production and I'm always sold out. I triple the production and I'm always sold out. Okay, that tells me something. That tells me people love these muffins, right? Okay, let's get a bigger facility. Let's produce more of it. Let's get it out to people. There's something super special about these muffins. Makes me a little bit more confident. Then what else are you doing? your production facilities in making these muffins. Are you doing it? Is somebody else producing these muffins for you and you're just reselling it? If so, what are you dependent on? Is it one factory? Is it multiple factories, right? And then are you actually making money on these muffins? I mean, do you have to sell a thousand where you're making some money or do you have to sell 10,000 where you're making some reasonable amount of money? And are you going to get tired of making muffins and move on at some point? If you hit all of a sudden people aren't buying muffins, they're buying something else, donuts, right? And is it easy to move into donuts if that happened? Because your clients might get bored of buying just muffins every day. They might want other things. What else could we be selling that Mm. same customer who already loves us and knows us and is telling everybody about us? I haven't even spent on marketing because people are talking about what I'm doing and Honestly, you're in a wonderful position if that's the case. If your product is loved so much that it's not costly to have people know about it and spread the word. So you've laid out all of these very clear, discrete risks that say, here's risk one, risk two, risk three. For an outstanding founder, for someone to really impress you and say, hey, this person knows their stuff, how should they communicate the risks as well as their mitigation plans? I think this question is even more about communication as opposed to what you're communicating. I think the single most important thing that a founder can do and to practice in front of other people is the elevator pitch on what the product and service is or what the company is. 
It has to be short and sweet. It has to be compelling. It can't have extraneous detail in it. It can have very specific information that somebody who's a lay person might not understand. So I think the communication methodology is super, super important. And even if it's a slideshow, it has to be really thoughtfully prepared. And there are a lot of online resources on how to prepare the very best slides to communicate. But I think it's important specifically about risk and opportunity to spend time on it. Here are the risks. Here is the opportunity. And here is how I'm going to be able to succeed. Very simple. I think simple, thoughtful communication actually reveals a lot about you. It means that you've really thought about it. You've gotten rid of all the extraneous detail and you're really shooting that arrow right to the target. Super, super, super important. It, it, the how you say what you say really matters. And I would absolutely encourage founders to be very mindful about that conversation and what they're communicating and how they're being, they're kind of getting ahead of what the question's are from an investor's perspective. And an investor for sure will say, what are the risks? How have you done? Where's the traction? How are you going to measure it? Answer those questions ahead. And already the conversation's much farther along. One last question on that. And then I want to move to networking, which is the fun part. So on the question of the model and the opportunity itself, now, obviously the financials are a huge part of that. What do you recommend to the founder and especially women, some of whom write wrong, indifferent, don't know, but they feel or perceive a fear in terms of, I don't want to deal with it, or they might be a reverse disinclination for the investors to be directing these questions at other people who may not be women. So what's your counsel on how do you master it? What and how do you communicate on your financials? Financials and numbers are the language of business. It is important to learn this language. If you do not know this language, you're going to have a hard time communicating with investors who speak this language fluently, right? So if you're going to France and you can't speak a word of French, you better either have studied it up, have a guidebook with you, or bring a translator. And I think this analogy holds for founders. If you are not as comfortable with accounting terms and financial terms, you have two choices. You either learn it or you bring somebody who totally is and you learn from them but you can't do without it because it is the way you communicate. You have to be able to communicate, what are my revenues and how do I look at that? What are my costs? How do I detail them? How do I look at profitability, right? What does my income statement look like? What does my cash flow statement look like? And there are a lot of resources to learn the basics. I think entrepreneurs really have to understand that. So I will share with you, my mom was an immigrant entrepreneur. And my mom did not have financial training, but my mom knew one thing, which is follow the cash and you have to do your service in a profitable way. My mom priced the work that she did and she priced it so that her costs were included and there was something left over because that's how she got paid. And she never, ever had an unpaid invoice because she would show up at her client and us to be paid. So following the cash is super important. And it's not as basic as that today, but I think there are certain basic things anybody who's running a business has to know. And that is, how are you charging for your work? What are the costs associated with that work? How much is left over? And how much cash do you have to need? And how much do you need to run your business? Your mom already my role model, so love what she did. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she 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 was my role model too and like so many lessons from her and follow the cash is an important one. I love it. That's going to be my new motto, follow the cash. So, just one last thing, what are the most common mistakes you see women founders make during this process of raising funding or throughout managing the money, asking for money, growing their businesses? One mistake is not developing some of these relationships early enough waiting. When they're in the process of fundraising, I see that people underestimate how long it will take because it does take long. And they also usually raise less than what they need, thinking that if they need more, they'll go back. So this is somewhat counterintuitive advice, 
But I think you should delay funding as long as you can, but never to the point at which you're desperate. So well before that point, raise more than you think you need and expect that the whole process will take longer than you expect it will. And so it is a balance. If you delay it longer, it means you really need to look at your business much harder and say, how much does it cost? How much can I do on my own until I get funding? And perhaps it provides some discipline as to how to price it, how to price and how to service your clients without adding too much cost, which means you're doing a fair bit yourself. At a certain point in time, when you realize there is market demand and you need to hire more people and it costs money to hire people, then you have to think about how can you fund it and can the revenues that come in fund the business that you're supporting. A lot of people don't focus on when they get paid. One of the pieces of advice I would give for people is try to find ways to get paid sooner as opposed to later because your clients, if they can fund some of your business, that's a good way to go. And like I said before, keep in touch with the people who could be potential investors, update them on how you're doing. And at the point at which you really do want to raise capital, you already have relationships and it makes a huge difference because then you can shorten the time frame to get funding. Awesome. It's a great segue into the next topic. I know that you've written a book, Meet 100 People. I bought it. I've given it to my son. Love it. I watched your TEDx talk on building your networks and stuff like that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts specifically for women founders. What suggestions, what advice would you give in terms of building networks, especially if you don't share affiliations that make it easier for you to get those introductions, to talk about things in common, went to the school, sure. belong to this club, what have you? Look, I think regardless of somebody's background, you have some affiliations. I mean, my parents were immigrants. And they knew other people who were immigrants, and that was part of their affiliation network, right? So go close at first. Try to tap those networks that you already have, the communities you already know. There are certain urban communities like New York, LA, Chicago, where there are lots of resources and there are more people that you can access. But even in smaller communities, there are existing networks that you can access that can be beneficial to you if you give it some thought. And my first recommendation to anyone as they build their network is to sit down and think, first of all, what is my current network? Is it the high school I went to, the college I went to, perhaps the ethnic affiliation that I might have, the neighborhood that I live in, the parents of my children's friends that I might be able to reach out to? Think about that very strategically. And then also think about why you're doing this, who could be helpful to you, what are you trying to achieve? So if your goal is to find a way to tap into angel networks, that is your goal. A good way is to see what university affiliations there may be, and it's certainly in large cities there are, and many colleges have investor networks as well. Many places have angel networks. Many locations have similar CEO networks or founder networks. Those individuals can be incredibly helpful. You can be helpful to them. They can be helpful to you. The question you ask them is, who did you talk to? Who have you accessed for funding? In a way, you have to be a little bit of your own researcher in building your network. And the best way to be successful, and I can think of countless stories where people have done this, is go to other people who have been successful and ask for 20 minutes of their time and say, may I reach out to you and ask you for your advice? I'm on this path. I would like to start and run this business. You're a successful entrepreneur. May I ask you for some advice? on your journey. I heard this recently about a very famous pop artist, songwriter, who when she first started out, went to all the other songwriters in Nashville and asked them, what did you learn? What would you have done differently? How would you have approached your career differently? Oh my God, how smart is that to ask other people who've been down the path? And that becomes part of your network. So I highly encourage founders to not think that they're in this alone. Talk to other founder CEOs, business owners, 
ask them for their advice and see what you learned in that process. I fundamentally believe that people are willing to help other people, especially if asked the right way. I fundamentally believe that warm introductions to people are a wonderful way to go, but even a cold call with the right message, with the right intro can get you in front of people who can be helpful to you. But it will not happen if you don't do it yourself. This is one of those things you can't outsource. You can't say somebody else is going to do it. These are relationships you need to build. And I also very strongly believe it doesn't matter what your background is in order to build these relationships if you do it the right way. And if you spend the time and effort to meet people who can be helpful to you. I love that. And it actually has paid off in significant ways in my own journey. So definitely that resonates. One thing I do want to double click on a little bit is when it comes to contacts with investors, you mentioned earlier yourself that it helps to start building the relationships well ahead of the time that you will need to tap into them. But I've also heard another school of thought that says, please do not send me unsolicited updates within air quotes on your business. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I don't have time. So given that there's always more demand for these people's time than there is supply, how do you get around that? Sure. Look, if somebody doesn't want to get unsolicited updates from you, they're not interested. Full stop. I think it's important to separate out those people who could be interested from those people who will not be interested. And there are a lot of people who won't be interested. And it's one of those things you have to kind of understand. The goal is to find those people where you do resonate, where you do fit with what they're trying to do, and they are interested. And so it depends on you to do the research. And it depends on you to try not to be unsolicited in that first contact, but to come in warm. Because I will tell you in my former company, we got thousands of unsolicited, and there's no human being that can go through those. So those were never looked at. But if you come in warm through a referral and somebody said, this person, Pat, I know you, and I think you should meet with this person, that's very different. So the hardest thing to do to get to investors is to find warm introductions or a way to create that warm introduction. If you have something in common with that person, a whole lot easier, you can make that cold call, right? And you can try to do it without a introduction from somebody else it's a whole lot more effort. And even then, if they say, I don't want to get unsolicited updates, that means they're not interested. They will tell you, please give me an update if they're interested. And is it fair to say that there are ways to filter potential investors that might be interested? For example, based on, would you use things like the sectors that they invest in, the stage of the company that they invest in, maybe some other investment thesis that says, okay, I'm only looking at Nashville I'm over-focusing on Nashville area startups, for example. Are those kind of like the breadcrumbs you use? And if so, are there other breadcrumbs that you can look out for and be vigilant to as you start building these networks? Those are exactly the breadcrumbs that you use. So don't send your business plan about your consumer goods company to a healthcare investor. I mean, it's probably not going to be of interest to them. Look for sector areas of interest. Look for regional areas of interest. Make sure you understand what size checks they write. And very importantly, study their portfolio companies. Look at the other companies they've invested because that gives you a clue as to what they're interested in because they've invested in them. And if in fact you see that this particular company is a foods investor, then they've invested in a drinks company, a chocolate company, and there is no muffin company there, say, you know what? You're a foods investor. You understand this consumer. This is the consumer I'm targeting. I have this incredible product that I am selling out of all the time. I would love to tell you about what I'm finding in the marketplace and how I'm doing as an introduction, you probably have a good chance of having a conversation there. But you've done your homework. You've looked at the other portfolio companies. Perhaps you know one of those companies. Perhaps you can reach out to one of those companies and say, this is an investor that I think would be perfect for my firm. What has your experience been with them? Is this an introduction you can make for me? I mean, those are all valid things to do. They do require effort. They do require time. I mean, there's no other way around it. This is a little bit of a time-consuming project, and you have to do your research to be able to get to the right people. 
Which brings me to a, a, another related point, which is you also need networks to source great employees. You need networks to source customers, especially if you're a B2B or even otherwise, you know, at least your early adopters. How do you suggest that founders optimize the time they have? You know, clearly the work is needed, but there's only 24 hours in a day. How should they optimize their networking efforts so that they can, first of all, they can contribute back to their networks in some way, because obviously it's around a theme of their business or whatever. And more importantly, try to get access to more of these kinds of folks, stakeholders, for lack of a better word, when they do need them and the right kind of people. What are, what additional things would you recommend? Sure. Look, at the beginning, I think it's incredibly important to focus on customers and clients. That is probably the single best use of your time. As you get to be a larger business and you can allocate people within your firm, if you've hired people to spend time doing things that you no longer need to do, then you can do things. I mean, you will have to be the individual that spends time on raising funding or even on hiring people. Your point was a really important one. The most scarce resource any one of us has is our time. And prioritizing where you spend that time is the single most important activity that you can possibly have. And you have to really think about your calendar and the time you have on your calendar and where should that time be spent? What is the ROI on that? There is some return on that investment that won't pay off for another six months or nine months. And yet it's very important to do. And there are some things that you do day to day that you shouldn't be doing. Somebody else should be doing it instead. And prioritizing that and figuring out who is the best person to spend time doing on whatever it is, is the single most important thing a founder can do. At the beginning, they're doing it themselves. As they continue to grow, they're finding people to take on those things they shouldn't be doing anymore. And they should be doing other very high value things like capital, dealing with customers, hiring new people. So to round all of this up, what kind of top five takeaways would you give to a founder to start working on or re-emphasizing tomorrow morning? Top five things, I think I probably would start with prioritizing time because again, that's your most scarce resource. I would very much focus some time on networking and building the network. So find who else can help you because that's a hugely important thing. You're not going to be able to do this all by yourself much as you wanted to. There's not a single unicorn company I can think of that is run by one person. So who else can be helping you? Top three, clients, customers. Really important to be in front of clients and customers and constantly having that iteration in terms of what you're doing. After clients and customers, it's going to be people who work for you, who's on your team, who's helping you. More broad than the network, very specific to your company. Who are you hiring? How are you thinking about it? And frankly, if I were to pick a fifth, I would think very hard about what is the culture you're trying to create with your organization? What is the why? How are you going to create this? How are you going to make this something that you're really proud of and that you're excited to go out and market to not just customers and clients, but investors as well? Excellent. Thank you very much, Pat. Is there anything that you wish I'd asked you, but I didn't? I think you asked a ton of questions. I think I answered the one that I think is a really important thing to answer, which is what is an important skill set on this? Look, being an entrepreneur is hard. There's no question about it. I think it's incredibly important to acknowledge that this is not an easy path. It has great benefits that you can reap over time, but are there going to be ups and downs? And so to be aware of the fact that there are going to be ups and downs, I think is hugely important. And then I think having the commitment to bear the storms, the terrible storm in Colorado, because you know you're getting out to LA, you either stop for a while until the storm clears, or you would march through with snow tires and on slow gear to be able to get through it. But you don't give up, right? You don't say, I'm not going to continue to do it. So I do think that if you know that you're the kind of person who will not give up and that is excited about new opportunities, then I think you can be a great entrepreneur. And I love working with entrepreneurs. I do think they're fantastic people. And for those of you out there who are entrepreneurs, I, I wish you all the best on that journey. I'm sure it's going to be a great one. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Pat. You've been extraordinarily patient and helpful and informative in helping us understand the challenges, the rewards, the questions and the key skills. So I really appreciate your time and thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You're most welcome. I enjoyed it. If there's one thing I learned really well from my conversation with Pat Headley, it is to constantly be able to look at your startup through the eyes of an investor or any funder, really. What are they putting in? What will they get out? What are the chances that they lose money? And how can you as the founder give them assurance, proof, and confidence in your sharp answers to each of these questions? No pitch to any kind of funder, whether it's an investor or a lender, is likely to succeed without clear answers to these questions from the founder to the funder. Can you answer these questions clearly, confidently, and concisely? Do you have a solid rationale to back up each of your answers? If it were your own money, would you be willing to write a big check as an investor in your startup? These are the big takeaways that Pat Headley teaches us in this conversation. So, what are you going to do to develop, test, and sharpen your answer to each of these questions for your startup? Thanks for listening to today's episode. We have show notes and more at achieve.co. That's A-C-H-I-I-V dot C-O forward slash podcast. Like what you heard? Hit subscribe and share with a friend. See you on the next episode. Now, go be an achiever.